Top of the morning to you. Hello and welcome to our special coverage of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm Olumide Macaulay. The headlines. The head of Wagner mercenary group, Yevgeny Prigozhin, claims his forces have completely seized the eastern Ukrainian city of Bakhmut. Russian President Vladimir Putin congratulates the Wagner mercenary force and Russian troops for claiming the Ukrainian city of Bakhmut. Plus, Ukraine denies Russia's claim, saying its, its forces are still in control of Bakhmut. And that's where we begin, the tussle for Bakhmut where the head of the Wagner mercenary group has claimed that his forces have completely seized the eastern Ukrainian city. Yevgeny Prigozhin said in a voice message on Telegram that no Ukrainian soldiers were left standing in Bakhmut and that the Wagner fighters controlled the city completely. The statement came after Ukraine said it still held on to parts of the eastern part of the city last week. The chief said that his forces will leave the front line in eastern Ukraine on May the 25th, after capturing all the territories they promised to capture to the last square centimeter. He also asked that he is handing over his positions to the Russian Ministry of Defense after Wagner forces leave the front line. Meanwhile, Russian President Vladimir Putin congratulated his Wagner mercenary force and Russian troops for claiming the city, while Prigozhin played down the role of the regular Russian army saying in the voice message that practically no one from the army helped us. Taking Bakhmut, which Russia refers to by its Soviet-era name, will represent Moscow's first big victory in the conflict in more than 10 months. The battle for Bakhmut has revealed a deepening split between Wagner, which has recruited thousands of convicts from Russian prisons and the regular Russian military. For two weeks, Prigozhin has been issuing daily video and audio messages denouncing Russia's military leadership, often in expletive-laden rants. On the other hand, Ukraine's deputy defense minister, Hanna Malayer, says Ukrainian forces have partly encircled Bakhmut along the flanks and still control a part of the city, denying Russian claims that the city had completely fallen and was theirs. Military spokesman Serhii Sharivati says Ukrainian forces there control a couple of buildings and have fortified constructions in the southwestern part of the town. The fight for Bakhmut has been the longest and bloodiest battle of the 15-month war, which Russia calls a special military operation. In the meantime, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky told a press conference at the Group of Seven summit in the Japanese city of Hiroshima that the eastern city of Bakhmut was not under Russian control, contradicting Russia's earlier claim. A top Ukrainian general said that Kyiv's forces controlled an insignificant part of the eastern city of Bakhmut, but that the foothold will be enough to enter the devastated city when the situation changes. President Zelensky, who likened the destruction of Ukraine's eastern city of Bakhmut with the destruction of Hiroshima in World War II, says there could be no other possible interpretation. Bakhmut has not been conquered by the Russian Federation. Leaders of the world's richest democracies said at the three-day G7 summit they will not back down from supporting Ukraine in a warning to Russian President Vladimir Putin as he claimed to have taken the city of Bakhmut. Meanwhile, Mr. Zelensky visited the Hiroshima Peace Memorial after a series of meetings with Group of Seven and other leaders. Accompanied by the Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida, he paid his respects to the atomic bomb victims and laid flowers at the memorial. Zelensky surprised attendance at the G7 summit in Hiroshima, the first city to suffer a nuclear attack also highlights Western concerns over the nuclear threat posed by Moscow. Upon his arrival on Saturday, Mr. Zelensky got a warm welcome in meetings with Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi, France's President Emmanuel Macron, 
and Britain's Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and others as he continued to call for support against Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Meanwhile, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky said he was confident that Kyiv will receive supplies of F-16 fighter jets from the West to help repel Russia's full-scale invasion of his country. Speaking at the news conference at the Group of Seven summit, he says in his words, we will have the planes. I can't say for, how, for now how many. It's not a secret. I don't know this myself. Mr. Zelensky also commended Kyiv's peace formula. He commented on it, saying it had the potential to prevent future wars by stopping the aggressors from launching them. He also played down the fact he did not meet President of Brazil, Lula da Silva, on the sidelines of the summit and said it was likely because of scheduling. Asked if he was disappointed, the meeting did not happen. He told the news conference he thought it was more of a disappointment for the Brazilian leader. Well, Brazilian President Lula da Silva said that a meeting with Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky on the sidelines of the Group of Seven summit in Japan fell through because President Zelensky was late. Mr. Lula said in his words, they made an appointment with Zelensky at 3.15 p.m., at 3.15 p.m. we received a message that Zelensky was late and I saw the president of Vietnam. The meeting with Vietnam took almost an hour and in that time Zelensky didn't show that's what happened. The Brazilian president also commented on relations between China and the United States saying, I don't want another Cold War to happen between China and the United States and for us to be subjected to the dispute between the two. U.S. President Joe Biden said that he had received a flat assurance from Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky that he would not use Western provided F-16 fighter jets to go into Russian you know, territory. This morning, Mr. Biden told reporters in Hiroshima, Japan, of the conclusion of a meeting of world leaders that F-16 warplanes could be used wherever Russian troops are within Ukraine and the area. He said it was highly unlikely the planes will be used in any Ukrainian offensive in the coming weeks, but that Ukrainian troops could need such weapons to defend themselves against Russian forces beyond their current reach. You know, and this morning, I once more shared and assured President Zelensky, together with all G7 members and our allies and partners around the world, that we will not waver. Putin will not break our resolve as he thought he could two years ago, almost three years ago. We're going to continue to provide economic, humanitarian, and security assistance to Ukraine so it can stand strong as long as it needs it. You know, in my private meeting with President Zelensky after the G7 meeting and with his staff, I told him the United States, together with our allies and partners, is going to begin training Ukrainian pilots in fourth-generation fighter aircraft, including F-16s, to strengthen Ukraine's Air Force as part of a long-term commitment to Ukraine's ability to defend itself. We provided the last year all that they needed to deal with what they were dealing with at the moment. And that's when and now we're moving in the direction of putting them in a position to be able to be defend themselves in ways beyond what they've had to deal with so far. I have a flat assurance from the from Zelensky that they will not they will not use it to go on and move into Russian geographic territory. But wherever Russian troops are within Ukraine and the area, they would be able to do that. We should have an open hotline. 
at the Bali conference, that's what the President Xi and I agreed we were going to do and meet on. And then this silly balloon that was carrying two freight cars worth of spine equipment was flying over the United States, and it got shot down, and uh, everything changed um, in terms of talking to one another. I think you're going to see that begin to thaw very shortly. Now, we're also united in our approach to the People's Republic of China. In the joint statement released yesterday, outlines the shared principles we've all agreed at the G7 and beyond in dealing with China. We're not looking to decouple from China. We're looking to de-risk and diversify our relationship with China. That means taking steps to diversify our supply chains, and we're not — so we're not dependent on any one country for necessary products. I've spoken at length with President Loon of South Korea. He came to Washington of late. He's agreed. We're all of the same agreement that, in fact, we are not going to — we're maintaining — we all agree we're going to maintain the one China policy, which says everybody kind of forgets — now, I mean, you all know, but the public kind of forgets that it says that neither country, Japan — I mean, China or Taiwan — Neither air territory can independently declare what they're going to do. That we're not going to tell China what they can do. We made, it, we made it clear that we don't expect we don't expect Taiwan to independently declare independence either. But in the meantime, we're going to continue to put Taiwan in a position that they can defend themselves. And there is clear understanding among most of our allies that, in fact, if China were to act unilaterally, there would be a response. It is building its military. And that's why I've made it clear that uh, I am not going to prepare — I'm not prepared to trade certain items with China. And when I was asked by President Xi why, I said, because you're using them to build nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction, and I'm not going to do it. And we've now got commitment from all of our allies. They're not going to either provide that kind of material that allows them to do that. President of the United States of America, Joe Biden. Meanwhile, he also announced a new package of military aid for up to about $375 million to Ukraine and told the Ukrainian president, Vladimir Zelensky, that the United States was doing all it could to strengthen Ukraine's defense for war with Russia. Mr. Biden said the military aid package included ammunition, artillery, armored vehicles, and training. The United States continues to do all we can to strengthen Ukraine's ability to defend itself, including launching some new joint efforts with our partners to train Ukrainian pilots on fourth-generation fighter aircraft like the F-16. And uh, this week, uh, the G-7 also uh, imposed hundreds of new sanctions and uh, export controls against Russia's assets to ensure that we uh, keep pressure on Putin to hold his backers accountable for this war. These are sanctioning him as well. And today I'm announcing the next tranche of U.S. security assistance to Ukraine, a package that includes more ammunition, artillery, armored vehicles to bolster Ukraine's battlefield abilities. And uh, the United States continues to help Ukraine respond, recover, and rebuild. And we're also supporting your pursuit of a just peace just uh, one aspect of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. It has to be non-negotiable. It just has to happen. So, Mr. President, what the people of Ukraine are defending, what you've achieved is a matter for the entire world to observe, and they're in awe of what you've done so far, really and truly. It's incredible. Together with the entire G7, uh, we have Ukraine's back, and I promise we're not going anywhere. So. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Mr. President. First of all, thank you for your help, leadership, for your support, and uh, really for this new package. That's great. Thank you very much from all our people. And I'm so happy that, you know, we have so strong relations with our people, that our people during this, all these challenges, they go shoulder to shoulder. I'm very thankful to American people, to, to you, your team, Congress, by partisan support, and I'm, I'm happy that between our teams there are strong relations with Jake and Andrew and Mr. Blinking, you know, our, our foreign minister, 
all of you, big team, and that really helped us. Uh, thank you. I remember your last brave historical visit to Kyiv, and uh, really our society uh, highly appreciate for this. And we spoke about very difficult decisions, and you did it with the training mission. We are very thankful. I think it will give us more strong positions on the battlefield. So we are very thankful that that is a new package. I really didn't know the, the details, but I know that you gave us very big package during this year. It's more than 37 billion. My appreciations. We never forget. Thank you. Well, you know, I, uh, some of my staff were saying that uh, we're supposed to be leading, but we seem to be following you. When I was in Kiev and those sirens went off, there was an air raider walking through. We just kept walking. I thought, well, he doesn't care about the sirens. I don't care about this. <laughs> I don't know. I'm a little worried that you're going to get in trouble. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate Mr. it. Mr. President, because it's left these Bakhmut still in Ukraine's hands, the Russians say they've taken. President of the United States, Joe Biden, President of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky. We're pleased to speak with Mr. Peter Dickinson now, publisher of Business Ukraine magazine, Lviv Today, editor at the Odessa Review. Thank you for joining us this morning. Good morning. Pleasure to join you. I picked up on a few things that President Joe Biden said, and one of them was that he had gotten a flat assurance from the Ukrainian president that the F-16 fighter planes won't be used beyond the geographical uh, terrain of Ukraine, in, and uh, thereby an incursion into Russian territory so as to not escalate the war. Now, is that enough to uh, make a military decision on sending as sophisticated a weapon as an F-16 fighter jets to Ukraine, knowing that in the heat of battle, things can change. Yes, um, the, the F-16s have a, a great potential to reach into Russia. Um, that's clear, and that was always one of the concerns, one of a number of concerns that prevented their earlier uh, delivery to Ukraine. Um, but on the other hand, uh, America and Ukraine's Western partners have been very specific in their military aid that it is not to be used against targets inside Russia. Uh, I think that there may be some leeway if there were to be individual incidents, um, but in general, I think Ukraine will be looking to use these fighter jets in Ukraine uh, to liberate the territories that are currently under Russian occupation and also, crucially, to defend Ukrainian airspace from Russian missile attacks. Uh, the, the F-16s will be a very, very uh, significant tool for Ukraine in terms of taking out missiles and taking out drones, uh, which are being regularly launched on an almost daily basis for the past month against, Ukrainian, against targets throughout Ukraine. So there is a lot of work for the F-16 squadrons that we expect in Ukraine. Uh, there is scope for them being used in Russia, but I think that any instances would be limited, would be uh, um, certainly not on a major scale. I don't think we'll see Ukraine. I think we will see Ukraine listening to Western concerns because they really can't afford to lose that support. Still on the F-16, it's not an Uzi, it's not a firearm, it's not a Kalashnikov, it's not a twin-engine turbine training plane. It's an F-16. If I'm to believe a Jordanian military person, uh, I gathered that it takes up to five to six months to get to be pilot ready for an F-16. And then it has to be a crash program. So um, this late in the day, and you are the one that spoke some weeks ago when we spoke to you that yeah, you, you, you hope it doesn't become a, a winter offensive, this counter offensive. How much should Ukraine rely on these F-16 fighter jets, given their sophistication and the expertise needed to fly one? Well, you're quite right, yeah. The time frame for the, the training is not going to be weeks, it's going to be months. There's currently debate over how many months. 
Uh, the, the most recent figures I've seen suggest actually three to four months, but even that would put the delivery date at around September. Um, so not in the summer, clearly in the autumn. Um, and also it's important to underline that we're not only talking about pilots here, we're also talking about ground crews, which are significantly right. larger. Uh, if, for example, Ukraine receives uh, dozens of planes, up to 50 planes, they will also need hundreds of ground crew. Uh, they need right. facilities where they can monitor them. So it's a, it's a major, major uh, logistical challenge. Um, Ukraine was preparing for its major counteroffensive without these planes. Um, it can continue without these planes. Uh, of course, these planes will provide a degree of local air superiority, uh, which would be hugely helpful. Um, but I think that it won't necessarily, I don't think that the, the, the planned counteroffensive will now be put on hold until the planes arrive. I expect Ukraine to proceed, um, but this counteroffensive we're, we're expecting is unlikely to end the war. Um, sadly, perhaps, uh, I, I think that the, there is plenty of time still for these jets to arrive in September, maybe even in October, and to play a big role in the, in the future development of the war. Another thing President Joe Biden said in that interview was he was looking in reference to China and their relationship with the United States not to decouple, in his words, but to de-risk uh, their relationship and not to uh, be subservient or depend, as a better word, on one nation for some key components in their economy as far as supply goes and trade. Uh, isn't he a bit late to the party? That's exactly what the Republicans and other critics of the United States uh, Democrats' party have been saying for years. Yes, uh, certainly there's been a lot. The, the idea that, that America is overexposed to China, that it has become too dependent on China for its manufacturing, for its imports, it is not new. It's been talked about for many years, uh, and frankly, it's fairly obvious. Um, but I think there was a sense in certainly on the Democrat, in the Demo within the Democratic Party and other, other elements within the American political establishment, that there was a, there was a mutual dependency uh, on both sides of the equation. It, it, on, uh, America and China were both mutually dependent in a way that somehow protected both sides' interests. Um, as China now plays a very delicate game in terms of its uh, support for Russia, in terms of its... Um, refusal to condemn the invasion of Ukraine, I think it's underlined the fact that China is not just a competitor, but a potential adversary, and it is not wise to put all your eggs in that basket. So I think we'll see more of this in the coming months, certainly from America and also from the EU. Mr. Dickinson, let's talk about Bakhmut. Vis-a-vis -vis the G7 uh, meeting where Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky attended and compared the destruction there to Hiroshima and the atomic bomb dropped by the Allied forces. But I want us to put a human face to that city. So people reading news items and watching television, it's a geographic location. To other people, it's their home. It was their place of business. It was a place where families gathered together. It was a place of transport and transit and laughter and joy and a human uh, habitat, but now that's a totally different story. What can you tell us about the people of Bakhmut and that particular city? Well, Bakhmut is a it, it's it's a town really, rather than a city. It's a, with a, it had a pre-war population of around um, I think sixty to seventy thousand people. Um, so it, it was a regional it was a regional center. It was not a major city, um, but it had a it, it had a you know its own history, its own traditions. It was well known for uh, sparkling wines that it produced. Um, it had a very strong uh, working class tradition. That part of Ukraine has a heavy uh, has, has, a, has a large base in, in heavy industry. So there's people involved in the mining community, in the in the, in the metals community, the metallurgy community. Um, very, very much working class, um, strong, strong communities. 
and that now has has gone. Um, the the city is is literally not, uh, and it is not hyperbole. It's literally reduced to ruins. Uh, there are a handful of people still living in the ruins, but the vast majority of people have either uh, have either died or been killed in the fighting, or mostly have fled the city. So uh, it's it's a, it, it is a tragedy. It is a horror story. Um, the images that, that reach us are, are chilling, um, but unfortunately they're not new. We've seen this happen to dozens of towns and cities in, in Ukraine. Uh, one thing I would underline is that the places that have suffered the most damage in Ukraine, they're mostly in East Ukraine, are also overwhelmingly Russian-speaking. Uh, now, uh, President Putin has claimed that his invasion is to defend the Russian speakers of Ukraine, uh, now, it, it's not an exact science to define someone as Russian or Ukrainian speaking, because most do tend to speak both languages, but predominantly in the cities that have been destroyed, Bakhmut certainly, uh, and Mariupol most famously, or infamously, they are predominantly Russian-speaking cities. So we're talking about Putin defending these people, uh, essentially by, by destroying their homes and killing them. Our empathy uh, for the people of Bakhmut and the people of Ukraine and the casualties suffered in that regard. To bring it further home, um, as I say, President Zelensky compared it to the destruction of Hiroshima. But if you remember Warsaw and Poland and how that location was destroyed by the Nazis, the Gestapo, a special... Uh, commando forces sent to raise it to the ground on orders of Hitler, and 70% of that city, Warsaw in Poland, was destroyed. I took a look at the picture of Poland, Warsaw, uh, during World War II. I, I took a look at a picture of, uh, of Bakhmut. Nary a difference in both cases. Yes, the, the destruction is on a level that we've not witnessed in Europe since World War II. Um, we are talking about a, a war that has that has uh, brought back a lot of memories of World War II in terms of the devastation. Um, there's no question that uh, you know we, we in Europe we had the the Balkan Wars of the 1990s, but the scale was completely different. Uh, we're talking about the destruction of entire towns and cities uh, and large scale loss of life amongst the civilian population. At this stage, the official figures for civilian deaths are are high, but not, uh, not, not, not stunningly so, if I could use such a term. I fear that the real numbers are not in the thousands, but perhaps in tens of thousands, certainly, and possibly, in fact, in the hundreds of thousands. Um, uh, it is important to get a sense of this scale in order to appreciate how, how grave the situation is for the civilian population. And this is another reason why Ukrainians are adamant they must liberate their country. They cannot allow Russia to retain any control over territories in the East and South, which are currently under occupation, because these atrocities will continue. And staying with Bakhmut, who are we then to believe? President Putin, who's uh, congratulated the mercenary forces and the Wagner mercenaries themselves who've taken photo ops and had their, their mercenary flag and the Russian flag in, and, this, and sent that all over social media, or the Ukrainians, who say that they've largely lost the, they haven't used those words, but they say that they, Ukraine still has control of the city. Russia has not taken over control of the city, but they maintain a certain portion and that they have an opportunity to encircle the entire location. Who are we then to believe? Well, the discussion, the debate, or the, the argument is essentially over over a, a, a small number of streets and even buildings. It's got to be that scale. Uh, there's no question that Russia now is in virtually complete control of Bakhmut. Uh, it may be the case that technically Ukraine still holds a very small foothold that could it could literally be as much as a few buildings, um, and then you then you have a discussion of well what constitutes the city. So it is a it, it is a it is a an academic debate in, in to, to some degrees. I think clearly Russia has control of the city. That is not a surprise. They've been gradually, uh, slowly but steadily gaining control of the city 
for for months now, since since February. Um, and the battle for Bakhmut itself dates back to last July. So it's a 10-month battle. I think what's crucial now is what comes next. Uh, Ukraine is looking to, uh, has advanced on the flanks of Bakhmut on both sides, the north and south. Um, they've managed to establish control over the high ground. So uh, essentially what we have now is Russia holding a, a, a ruined city and Ukraine uh, holding the, the ground ahead of it to prevent any further Russian advances. Uh, Ukraine now says they will seek to continue this encirclement, perhaps to cut the Russian troops off in Bakhmut. It does not look clear that Russia can advance further, so we may have a stalemate situation. There are also uh, expectations that Ukraine's counteroffensive will take place elsewhere. So we may see that Bakhmut actually, after being in the headlines for so many months, will, will quite quickly disappear from those headlines. Russia criticizing the G7 summit in Hiroshima, Japan, have described it as a propaganda party for Ukraine, diminishing its value. Uh, are you of that opinion? And secondly, um, skeptics are wary of the influence the G7 has at this moment in time over uh, world economies. We understand that in the 80s, those particular nations uh, had about 70% of the world economy in their kitty, but that has shrunk to about 44%. And it, is, it, is, it was reported that that's why uh, they had they invited other nations who are outside the G7 summit for a buy-in so that any of the sanctions that they come up with could be supported by other countries farther afield. What is your impression of the influence that the G7 countries can have in the way of sanctions in the first place, as I've asked? Uh, well, I think the G7 format is certainly dated. Uh, it's, it's clearly not as influential a grouping as it was when, the, when it was first uh, conceived. Uh, that's clear. The, the, the global trend is clear. Uh, the the, the so-called global south, uh, which could really be seen as the non-Western world, uh, is, is, is growing increasingly influential, increasingly economically powerful, uh, and that trend will continue. Uh, we're seeing that we're seeing the rise of China and India. We're seeing the rise of Africa. We're seeing the rise of other countries such as Brazil, um, Indonesia, uh, of course, the Middle East. So clearly, the, a world where the West is able to dominate all international affairs it, it, it is on the way out. We will not live in that world for much longer if we still live in it today. Having said that, um, Europe and America remain extremely uh, influential. They're very wealthy countries. They have a very strong uh, influence also in terms of technologies, in terms of innovation, in terms of aspirations. This is still where people wish to go and live where they wish to study, where they wish to save their money, hold their money. Uh, these are the businesses that have the, have the stranglehold on global innovation, on, on, on global markets. So uh, they can't be discounted. And they, again, they will also remain very significant. I think at this stage, the most important thing for G7 was the fact that, they, that, that the countries all sent a very strong message to Russia uh, that they will remain committed to Ukraine. Uh, Russia's main hope is that the West will lose interest. The West will say, you know, we tried, it's taking too long, it's too expensive, we want to move on to something else now. We're bored of this, essentially. We don't want to accept the costs. And the message from, from uh, Hiroshima was very clearly, don't think you can outlast us because you can't. And that was seen as crucial, certainly from Kiev's point of view. Mr. Peter Dickinson, always a pleasure. You know the saying, so much to do, so little time had more ground to cover, but um, obviously for that reason, we have to let you go. But we really appreciate your perspective on these issues. Thanks for having me. Mr. Peter Dickinson, the publisher of Business Ukraine magazine, Lviv Today. After the break, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov says decisions taken by the Group of Seven at the summit in Japan were aimed at double containment of Russia and China. Details in a moment. Please stay with us.
Welcome back to our special coverage of Russian invasion of Ukraine. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak says that Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky's presence at the Group of Seven Leaders Summit in Hiroshima in Japan over the weekend was of historic significance and sent a strong message of unity amongst G7 allies in the face of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Mr. Zelensky had initially been scheduled to participate in the summit online, but made a surprise appearance on Saturday in person. It was a privilege to welcome him to Chequers earlier this week. And I believe his attendance at this G7 was a moment of historic significance. The image of the G7 and our partners standing shoulder to shoulder with President Zelensky sends a powerful message about the unity and determination of the G7 allies. We will stand with Ukraine for as long as it takes because their security is our security. The G7 strategy is clear. Our military, diplomatic and economic tools are all part of the Ukrainian counteroffensive. We're delivering more support on the battlefield through air defence, artillery, tanks and long-range missiles, which the UK was the first country to provide. We're supporting Ukraine to develop the air force it needs for the future, with the UK training Ukrainian pilots starting this summer. And we've made a real breakthrough at this summit, thanks to President Biden's support for an international coalition to provide F-16 jets. It's Japan's presidency of the G7 and Prime Minister Kishida's leadership of it um, that has led to this outcome, and he deserves enormous credit for extending the invitation to President Zelensky and ensuring that the summit was successful. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, Canada's Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, told Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky that the G7 in Canada stands strongly in support of Ukraine. Mr. Trudeau said, and Mr. Zelensky met in Hiroshima where the group of seven gatherings focused on undermining Russia and managing China with a show of force behind the Ukrainian leader. Western countries used the event to announce new sanctions against Moscow and vowed to pump even more weapons, military assistance and cash into the fight. I just have to say it is uh, so good to see you. It is uh, obviously important conversations going on. The G7 stands uh, strongly in support of you, as does Canada, but really good conversations with emerging economies and the global context as well. Uh, lots of good sessions this morning. But I have to say, we, we talk every few weeks. But it's so nice to be able to see you in person and so nice to be able to, uh, to, be able to actually talk directly like this. So I'm really happy. Canada Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Now, for the Russians, Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said that decisions taken by the group of seven countries at their summit in Japan was aimed at double containment of Russia and China. Addressing a televised conference, Mr. Lavrov reiterated Russia's claim that the West is using Ukraine as a tool to inflict a strategic defeat on Russia. The United States and its allies reject that narrative saying they are helping Kiev defend itself against an illegal war. The G7 agreed to tighten sanctions against Moscow and pair back exposure to China. They also urged China to press Russia to halt its military aggression and immediately withdraw its forces from Ukraine. Mr. Lavrov said the West was putting pressure on countries to cut trade and economic ties with Russia, but Moscow had support from a lot of allies. Now, we'd like to talk to Mr. Dakwat Thomas, expert on international relations, theory, Lagos State University in Lagos, southwest Nigeria. It's good to have you on the program this morning. Yeah, thank you, Olimide. It's one thing for, as uh, Rishi Sunak, the British PM, says, to, have send in, to send a strong message of support for Ukraine by its allies at the G7 is another thing to implement certain decisions that will put enough pressure on Russia to withdraw from Ukraine. Uh, critics have said that 
it's only the UK, for instance, that has practically uh, banned import or trade of uh, Russian diamonds, Russian tin, and some other goods, as opposed to the other G7 countries who've only perhaps been paying lip service in the issue of certain trade. For instance, diamonds with Russia, saying that sometime in the future they will, you know, have a policy that totally stops that trade with Russia from happening. So do you think that this is sincerity of the G7 countries to stop trade with Russia, in some cases very profitable and gone on for, for, for decades, is, do you think that sincerity is across the board? Well, it depends on their commitment. And uh, I want to say for now that each country has a regime of sanctions and a procedure for imposing the sanctions and implementing the sanctions. And I'm so sure that, yes, the, it's very likely that some of these countries, uh, based or depending on their disposition towards uh, uh, the issue of trade in terms of the diamonds and in terms of gold, uh, would at the appropriate time take decisions on when to start their own regime of sanctions as it comes, uh, I mean, as the, I mean, as it concerns. Uh, Russia, I mean, as it concerns diamond and gold trade. Uh, for now, yes, possibly, you know, they have to really think over all these things before they go ahead with the position, move with the sanctions. Uh, I want to believe that the considerably, to a very considerable extent, most of the nations have shown greater commitment, a very serious commitment to the Ukraine cause, and they are likely to uh, still some other countries are likely to still move ahead with uh, their own sanctions on the, the trade of gold and diamonds. The Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has uh, said that in that regard, that this G7 summit is to alienate Russia, I'm paraphrasing, to alienate Russia and China. So they're bringing China up. And the President of the United States has talked about uh, their relations with China and what they're doing as this G7 summit. Is it helpful for them knowing that China has been openly trying to show its mediation objectives concerning the Ukraine war, sending the Chinese envoy to certain locations? Why are they bringing China up now? Well, the issue of China, ordinarily, you know, the G7 is all about economy. And uh, they, they have problems with the way China has been aggressively pursuing its economic uh, policy. And uh, they think that it is, it is high time they uh, sent a very strong message to the kind of bullying that China has been doing. Well, China on its part sees it as an aggressive economic policy drive, uh, but the G7 group, as a group does not see it like that. However, um, when Lavrov was talking about double containment, I believe that he's just trying to create the impression that um, Russia and China are in this game together. But unfortunately, uh, I don't think so. It's only um, Russia that is trumping up this issue of China's involvement or China's support. And because it doesn't want to be seen to be isolated completely from another superpower, because by the time it's not bringing in China indirectly or somehow, it will show that it is just a superpower that is completely isolated or that is a prior state by the other powers. So the impression being created by Russia is just to stimulate a kind of feeling, global feeling, that is not in this project to I mean, alone. Uh, as for whether China is going to, I mean, whether it is appropriate to be talking about China at this time. Well, I, I, I think that it is, there is need to address China, that this act of indifference has been unhelpful in ensuring that, uh, uh, the, 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 in ensuring a direction or a roadmap for, the, for, for bringing this war to an end, in the sense that what else do you want to do? You have been to Russia, you have spoken to uh, uh, Putin, you have already, sp you have spoken. In fact, the, 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 I mean, Biden called you for almost one hour, you are doing video call with Biden, 
I think sometime last year. And again, the, the um, Zelensky has also gotten in touch with you and all these things. Yet, in after, I mean, after one year plus, almost one year, four months now, you have not been able to have a definitive pronouncement or definitive position on this war. So I am suspecting some kind of, uh, uh, I'm suspecting some kind of dirty game being played by China. And obviously it's good for China that this is happening because I know that China is waiting for what the outcome will be like so that it can only, I mean, it will be able to defy its own direction towards Taiwan because there is no difference between what is happening to Ukraine and what will happen to Taiwan in case Russia wins this war, you know, uh, is going to give a positive direction or positive inspiration to China. So this is what the game is like, because I believe that either to Russia or to uh, the West or to Ukraine, that China has been a bit indifferent towards the, the, the Ukrainian war. Because what has China given to Russia? We have seen that West is giving a lot to Ukraine. So that shows positive support and so, so positive assistance. But what has China given? I mean, if a whole China is being intimidated, is being uh, bullied by the US, when Xi Jinping visited Russia, he was warned by Blinken, Blinken, not even Biden, he was warned by Blinken not to give or make any promise of supplying leather ammunition or leather weapons towards Russia. Until date, China has not been able to give anything to, to Russia. So where is the support coming from? It's just a moral thing. It's just a moral thing that, okay, this is how it's happening. But I believe that China, I'm suspecting the role of China in this whole uh, compass. When you say you're suspecting the role of China, could you elaborate a bit further? Because um, you said that they're indifferent and that they're not showing uh, any sincerity, to paraphrase you. But haven't the latest uh, attempts by China to mediate sent a different message? No, that's not, that's, not a, that's not a peace plan. That's not a peace process. The peace process will be definitive. The peace process he has proposed, which, that China has proposed, is not definitive. There is nothing there. You know, when you are saying that uh, Russia, I mean, uh, this should happen, that should happen. Now, for the Ukrainians, they expected you to say that for any peace negotiation to commence, you must withdraw first. That is the natural thing expected of any nation that wants to mediate in this kind of uh, war. You know, you must be able to say that move away. Let us return to the status quo ante before the war. You know, let us have that kind of situation scenario before we can discuss. You cannot be talking of negotiation when about four regions had been uh, annexed. You are talking, you know, before the war, before this present war of 2022, the 2014 was still a stalemate. And then that one is still there. Even if you are not going to address the issue of 2014, why not address the issue of 2022? In 2014, Crimea was annexed. Crimea and its four cities were annexed. And then uh, uh, Luhansk, I mean, Donbass, was virtually under siege. And then now, in 2022, you, when you attacked, you have already incorporated or annexed four regions. You have annexed Kherson, you have annexed Donetsk, you have annexed uh, uh, Luhansk, and then you have annexed Saporizhia. And those regions are still under occupation. So now for any peace process to start, you must go back either to the pre-2014 uh, 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 condition or pre-2022 condition. So which one has China taken now? China has not taken any particular position. So that is, this, that is, this, the, that is what is giving me this, the, 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 this kind of feeling of suspicion about China's role in the game. We are, what is, the, what we are, I mean, you can see Zelensky's uh, 10 point peace process. It is definitive. And that is what he has taken to the, to, to, to the uh, Saudi summit. That is what he has even presented, presented again to the G7 summit. So we are, what, what, I mean, I have read the Chinese uh, uh, position. I have not seen anything definitive. And when you are in this kind of situation and you have no definitive a position, then that means that are, your, your, your role is suspect. The West, NATO, everybody, we can, we can see where they are going. They are going with Ukraine. They have taken position. They are supporting Ukraine. 
They are doing everything to ensure that Ukraine wins this war. They are doing everything to ensure that Russia does not win this war. But where is the role of China? What is the role of China? That is, the, that is what I'm telling you, that China is just interested in the outcome of this situation, in the outcome of this war, as to be able to redefine, or as to be able to define clearly what its own aggression or what its own uh, uh, position will be towards Taiwan. Because the moment Russia wins this war against Ukraine, then it presents a kind of a, a, a kind of replica, a kind of scenario, a kind of situation that China will now be used as a template okay. for its own attack or invasion of Taiwan. Plenty of food for thought. Thank you so much, Mr. Dakwa Thomas, experts on international relations theory, Lagos State University, for being on the program with us this morning. Thanks for having me. I mean, thanks for having me. God bless you. Australian Prime Minister Anthony Alb Albanese said he had been concerned for some time over China's activity. He highlighted the chaffing or dangerous interception of an Australian military plane in the South China Sea region by a Chinese fighter aircraft in May 2022. He also called on Beijing to provide transparency over diplomatic issues such as the case of detained Australian journalist Shang Li. Ourselves as well, the shrape we had a discussion. On, on the China language, uh, we, we have said for some time uh, that uh, China's activity, and we've expressed concern for ourselves as well, the shrafing of one of our aircraft, uh, the other activity that we've seen, uh, has provided uh, concern. We've expressed that concern. Uh, in the past will continue to do so. Uh, what we need to do is to make sure uh, that we work in a way that enhances peace, security and stability in the region. We very clearly support the status quo when it comes to the Taiwan Straits. Uh, on every opportunity uh, we raise uh, those issues uh, because the detention of uh, uh, Cheng Li, for example, hasn't even been able to speak to her children. Uh, that's not appropriate. Uh, we need transparency. Australia will continue to make representations uh, to China on behalf of our citizens. And I believe that we have. We have set out to do what we said we would. I, I support uh, the G7 communiques uh, about the international relations that we have uh, there also about uh, Ukraine and the support for uh, President Zelensky who will be here today at the G7 meeting and uh, they also are about uh, a positive statement about the need to reduce uh, nuclear weapons and a pathway uh, forward on that. Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese, his words on his concern over Chinese activity concerning Ukraine brings this edition of our special coverage of Russian invasion of Ukraine to a close. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Alumide McCauley. Do join us again tomorrow for a new edition. See you again.